Hello everyone, Books with Banks back again with another video. Uh, today I'm back to continue my reread of Ian C. Esselman's Malazan prequel books, uh, his Path to Ascendancy series, and today I've just made it through the first half of book three in that series. This one is called Kellenved's Reach. Uh, I continue my return to these via audiobook, uh, still narrated by John Banks, who continues to do a wonderful job. And today I wanted to give my overall impressions on the first half of this book. Uh, I'll say only mild spoilers for all of these prequels, uh, so please proceed at your own caution. And if you haven't already, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe. Thank you so much. So, before getting into Kellen Bed's Reach, let's go back to see what comments uh, I wanted to respond to or interact with from my last video. Uh, so, not too much in the way of comments on the last review I did, but someone did point out that the Kalor storyline from Dead House Landing, book two, um, Kalor storyline uh, that I wasn't all that crazy about, uh, this commenter uh, pointed out that it would at least be worth a reread of like other Kalor uh, heavy books and storylines, like a few of the uh, volumes of Erickson's Book of the Fallen, just to see if anything from uh, this particular event, that particular thing recounted in Dead House Landing, is ever referenced in those later books. Uh, I do think Esselman has shown that uh, he does a really a good job trying to use these prequels not only to tell compelling tales in their own right, but also to flesh out and really bolster the effect of the character arcs and stories in both his novels of the Malazan Empire series as well as his friend Erickson's Malazan Book of the Fallen series. Speaking of which, what future novels does this book, book three, Kellen Vett's Reach, help out the most? Or what does this kind of foreshadow to the most? Uh, or, yeah, support. Well, uh, I think for at least one storyline in particular here, that of a character named Origin Samar's uh, or Origin Samar and his mercenary troop. Um, this troop, they're hired to fight for the Nam Purge people against the Quan Tali. Uh, if I have my geography right, this is all happening on the western side of the continent. Uh, and this Origin Samar character, from what I, re I remember, I am the hints that you get so far through the first half of this, uh, Origin turns out to be someone very important for later books, in particular some of Esselmont's later books. Uh, but this is kind of a nice segue into the various storylines of this book. Uh, so we have that origin thing going on. What else is going on? Um, so you have Nam Purge versus Quanta Lee in the West, and then you have the Blurian League fighting against city-states like Gris in the East. Uh, again, I believe I have my geography and politics correct here. So, Origin Samar's storyline is one that conveys how chaotic the mainland politics are in the West, and then with that other side of the continent, we have this young duo of characters named Haraj and Gregar. Uh, they're hinted at both being super powerful in their own ways, and they desperately want to join the Crimson Guard, or at least one of them does. Uh, but through a botched escape plan and then a series of unfortunate events, uh, they both find themselves fighting for the Yellow Regiment of the Blorian League. I think Esselmont is writing this duo extremely well. Uh, the way they play off of each other, the comedy there, uh, some of the emotion there. Uh, it's easily one of the storylines I'm most invested in of the prequel trilogy so far. Uh, but anyway, these two storylines of Origin on the one side and the two young friends on the other, uh, they're captivating and they both promise to basically be the subtle origin stories of a few of Esselmont's favorite characters. Uh, but they also stress the disunity and fragile political situation on the continent, or all over the continent. And one can imagine Esselmont is doing this to show how Eventually, uh, this made it even easier for Kellenved and Dancer to start Dancer to start up their uh, their own empire, but we're not quite at that point where our main characters' ambitions, uh, what they're forming, what they're getting going with their empire, we're not at the point where all of that is really having much of an impact on some of these other disparate threads. Meanwhile, uh, I had forgotten that this book also gives us some background on one of my favorite priest characters from Erickson's series. Uh, up through the halfway point, the priest has more served to explore the unrest in the south region of the continent, and this comes complete with a section all about Poliel, a very interesting goddess, a goddess I enjoy reading about, the goddess of plague and disease. Um, I really enjoy this priest character, uh, his, his section so far. 
Other than that, we touch in with Nobles and Ikka Khan, and we touch in briefly with Silk and a couple others in Li Heng, just to sort of keep those dangling threads left over from book one, just to keep those threads still in the mix somehow. Uh, but now for the main event, what are Kellenved and Dancer up to? Well, the little stone or flint arrowhead that Kellenved's been fiddling with basically for the whole series so far, this little trinket finally becomes the focus of their storyline as it literally points the way to a great source of power. Uh, and at the halfway point in the book, this mystery is still being unraveled. There was sort of a dead end, but that might have been a little bit misleading. Uh, but for any Malazan fans out there reading this, I'm pretty sure Esselmont knows that we all know where this is probably headed um, with a certain army that Kellen that may or may not eventually gain control of. Uh, furthermore, I'd actually say that the other uh, Malazan Empire stuff going on is even more interesting. Uh, Esselmont is showing us how clever and crafty Surly is with her army of spies, her claw organization. Uh, and I'm noticing more this time around how Esselmont is showing us really the mighty foundations of the Malazan military. Uh, so you have people like Dasim Ultor training the soldiers and the melee combat combatants, uh, and you have also Cartharon Crust put in charge as High Fist. Um, and these are two very uh, fair-minded uh, characters who have shown their leadership abilities. And then on the mage side of things, you have Tashrin putting together his uh, pretty kind of sketchy cadre of mages, uh, many of which Malazan fans will remember from all the way back at the Siege of Pale, uh, beginning of Gardens of the Moon, probably some of the first stuff that us Malazan fans ever read about, uh, some of the first characters we ever met. So, so that's really fun seeing them uh, introduced or reintroduced here. You also have Nidurian, and Nidurian is a mage, but also a veteran of the Talian Iron League, uh, League Iron Legion, forget exactly the name. Um, and Nidurian is in charge of finding other mage talents to put like one squad mage per squad. Uh, I didn't mention Nidurian in my last videos, but he was introduced in Deadhouse Landing, uh, and there like a nice window uh, viewpoint into both the groups of the group of mages on Mal Malaz Island. But also, um, Nidurian had a viewpoint on some of the gang warfare uh, stuff going on there as well. Where I'm at right now, a big battle is underway, a battle that's been foreshadowed pretty much uh, and expected since the beginning of Book 2, Deadhouse Landing. And meanwhile, the various political warfare conflicts continue to rage on all around the con uh, continent. Honestly, this one doesn't feel quite as disjointed as the previous book so far, but I don't 100% remember how all of these storylines wrap up, so I will be excited to continue on and give my more complete review in about a week. If I had to give one negative, because I've been overwhelmingly positive about this so far, I will say that this can this book continues the trend of Deadhouse Landing to, like, there's some weird scenes that it's, I guess they're... There's, it's a type of comedy that just doesn't vibe with me uh, very well, but it's like, oh, how did we start calling the generals or the like high commanders in our armies? How do we start calling them fists and high fists and stuff like that? And there's just like this sort of comedic debate that's a few pages long all about what should we call like the person in charge and everyone reading knows, okay, so they eventually become known as high fists. Esselmont does that type of scene with people's names, like when Kellenved changed his name from Wu to Kellenved, it played out in a very similar way. Um, and just sort of like the origin of why things are called what they're called, um, with the sort of winking like nod of like, oh, I know you readers know what this is, what term they're eventually going to settle on, or what name they're eventually going to settle on. I'm just gonna say that type of comedy stuff uh, doesn't really work too much for me. And I think um, this isn't like the only prequel out there that does stuff like this. I mean, you can see prequels all over the place that um, have weird sort of origin or scenes to explain the origins of stuff that just doesn't necessarily need much of an explanation. At least I don't feel like uh, some of the stuff needs much of an explanation. Um, but yeah, again, that kind of small quibble aside, um, overwhelmingly positive thoughts on this so far halfway through. Uh, it is the shortest of uh, these prequels, and I, I kind of, I guess we'll see how it wraps up, but I wouldn't have minded necessarily a longer book to explore 
maybe a few more characters in those different warring conflicts because we only really get one or two vantage points into either of like what's going on with the Blorian League or what's going on with Namper or with the uh, Origin Samar's troop. We don't, we don't get that much of like a fleshed out picture of what those conflicts look like. Um, again, don't remember exactly how all of these storylines wrap up or how every single one wraps up, uh, but I'll be really excited to find out. Uh, but anyway, that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye.